It's a fact. So let's go ahead and uh, try to give Yuanji a call and try to get him in here. Yo, yo. Hey, what's up? All right, let me pull up my OBS and make sure that the audio levels are fine. Uh, so we'll just chit chat while I'm doing that. How have you been? I'm doing good, Nathan. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. So we we have a, a very similar hobby in common, uh, yes. and, and I'm referring to poker, of course. Uh, and so, how are your poker ventures going? Are you focusing more on tournament or cash games? What's your preference right now? Uh, I've been playing tournaments. Actually, if you asked me like a week ago, I'd have been like. It, not so great, but I just won ten thousand dollars last weekend. So hell yeah, hell yeah! You just did. You just ran oh, deep in nice. a. You ran deep in a tournament. Yeah, I got second in a, in a big tournament. Okay, are you playing yeah, mostly online, playing. or are you playing? Um, because you're up in Jersey, right? So you can play online. Yeah, I'm playing. I'm playing all basically all online right now. Um, gotcha. But I am excited to get into you know playing live. Hell yeah, hell yeah! It, it's it's a whole nother beast. But I mean, you know. Tournament play, I was more of a cash game player, but I did spend a lot of time studying the ICM model and stuff like that. I just never uh, got the opportunity to, like, fit, due to being in the military, to play in any, like, physical tournaments. Oh, yeah. And I didn't live in Vegas or New Jersey. I don't know. I don't, have they added any other states that allow for online players? Is it just still Vegas and, uh, or Nevada and uh, Jersey? Um, I know that Poker Stars, New Jersey, and Michigan, I think, are linked together. Mm -hmm. Oh, someone's saying to, I think, uh, is it Kyle or somebody on the Card Guys account is saying that I should be turned up maybe like five or ten levels. Yep, we can do that. We can do that. Um, and there, there's some, there's some, uh, so the, actually the site that I play on, it's called Global Poker. It, you can actually play on this site in any state. It they're like a, a little, I I don't know. It's like semi. You're, it's the gray area of legality because I think that they like operate through like sweepstakes or like however you want to call. I don't know, man. Like uh, I just don't think about it that much. But, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I I know I know that that I think it's getting legalized in a lot more, more and more states uh as we speak i think i honestly i think um probably like the people who are behind like DraftKings, or, like FanDuel, are like doing like a big push to you know get like their services like also just like legalized in more states that i mean that would be awesome that would be awesome for people like me because i i was stationed down in biloxi mississippi and there's like nothing there except casinos and i would play probably 20 to 25 hours a week uh live cash games uh anything from like one three i think i peaked out at 510 was about about as high as i would get before stuff just yeah. felt a little uncomfortable and there's like a golden rule in poker that if you ever reach a point to where you ever like think twice about something being too much you're in the wrong bracket so i kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. i tiptoed sure. in there and i was like uh but like five i would say like Two five is like, you know, kind of like a sweet spot uh, for me personally. But um, yeah. yeah, so good to have you on. I've already kind of introduced some of the topics that we're going to be discussing. Uh, just go ahead, introduce yourself, tell everybody what you want them to hear. Of course, we have the amazing picture up on the screen now. <laughs> uh, we had to yeah, I... <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I picked that picture because I think I thought it would be funny. Um, what's up, guys? Uh, my name is Yanji. I am a founding member of Team Runaways, or Fabled Runaways. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have a great passion for playing Flesh and Blood, but also um, for trying to help other people get better at Flesh and Blood. It's just kind of the reason why we make, like, a lot of the content that we make. It's, like, geared towards, you know, trying to help everyone level up their game and also why I reached out to you, Nathan, when I saw you made that Twitter post because, you know, I can sympathize with that feeling. I've felt it in the past many times myself 
and still feel it like from time to time. Um, just like the feeling of, you know, not like doing like pretty good, but not, you know, like converting at the highest level, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and just so you're aware, I do not have chat on the screen right now, but I'm going to monitor it as we talk. And if they get any questions, I told chat to kind of like, if they have any questions about anything, just throw it up there. I'll give it to you. Uh, and then we can kind of like go over it. Uh, somebody said Keesler base or CB. I was on, I was Navy, but I was on the Keesler base um, because that's where my uh, meteorology school was because I was a meteorologist in the Navy. Uh, you actually napping vertically. Okay, he sent the picture horizontally in his defense. He does not sleep up <laughs> and down. Uh, just I got we got kind of lazy on like making the layout or whatever. So I just like put the picture over the chat box or Kyle did, uh, and you know we were like, hey, it works, it works. So we, we we're doing what we got. We're doing what we got. Um, he does not nap vertically. <laughs> so, okay, so what what do you want to go over first? Do you have a preference? Um, yeah, let's talk about, um, cause I, the last thing that I saw you guys were talking about in the chat was like the mm -hmm. idea of playing the best deck or like getting over the fear of playing the best deck, right? Yep. Yeah. So I think this is a topic that, <clears throat> uh, before I was playing flesh and blood, I used to play magic, the gathering mm -hmm. and I think for like a good two years, I was like hardcore grinding the game. I was always, like, felt really good about playing limited because, you know, you just, like, show up and then you play, like, whatever the cards that you open or, like, or whatever you draft. But in, in constructed formats, I kind of faced that fear a lot where I would oftentimes find myself, like, brewing my own decks or playing rogue decks. And I did pretty well in a lot of tournaments. Like, I, I got at like basically the equivalent of like flesh and blood callings like grand prix i've i've placed in like top 16 um always like maybe like one win away from like making top eight like i was live until like the last round sounds familiar sounds familiar <laughs> yeah, yeah so i know exactly where you're coming from where and you know it wasn't until i got into flesh and blood that I started trying to play the best decks. And so my fear in Magic was always like, I remember really clearly, there's like one tournament where I think one of the best decks that you could play in uh, the modern format in Magic was like Jund. And like, whatever, like it's an expensive deck, but I could like borrow the cards from people. Like that wasn't the problem, but I was like kind of afraid. It's like, oh, if I play against like Reed Duke on Jund or if I play against like these other players, who have been playing the game longer than me and who have like more experience or whatever, then I'm never gonna beat them in a mirror match or something like that, right? And I'm not gonna be like these players that I thought were who were better than me. If I chose to play something that wasn't like off meta or like uh, like not on people's radars. Mm -hmm. And like part of the only reason why I started gravitating towards playing the best deck in flesh and blood was kind of getting over that fear because I think a lot of it is mental. It's like psychological. You're putting yourself in like a bracket when you're saying like, oh, I'm not not as good as like these other people. Like you've already kind of lost the battle at that point, right? Like when, you, when you're choosing to play like what you believe to be a worse deck, like it's completely different if you actually believe that your like off meta deck is actually the best deck, which can sometimes be the case, right? Right. But if you're saying like, I'm going to make a suboptimal choice because I need an edge into people who are quote unquote better than me, one thing that I've kind of learned from my time competing in Flesh and Blood is that even the best players oftentimes make like a lot of mistakes. Um, and it might be hard for you to like spot those mistakes, but they're still, you know, they're still making them. Like I talked to Michael Fang during tournaments all the time and he's like, oh man, like I played like this turn or that turn like incorrectly or whatever. Like, and, and, you're, and they're like, so they're not gonna like necessarily be like punting into you, but they're gonna be like making mistakes here and there. And like the only real way that you can, you know, that, that you can pilot these like best decks better than these players that you respect is by, you know, putting in effort and, and time and, and practicing and getting comfortable. And it's like, how are you ever going to get that level of proficiency if you're never playing the best decks, you know, like, right. Like, I think like Michael Fang was playing Oldham, like until the wheels fell off. Right. Right. I agree. And um, real, real quick. Uh, so I think this yeah. is a great chance to like give a couple examples of like 
how I have like strayed away from that decision uh, because what yeah. you, what you actually mentioned is exactly is the exact reason why I didn't play Oldham. Uh, mm-hmm. So I never registered Starvo because I just didn't like the casino feel to it, even though it was sure. cl- probably clearly the best deck. Um, and I never played Oldham. Uh, I played. I, I take that back. I played it at one Blitz event. I think it was a Battle Harden or something, but it was Blitz. Um, and so it yeah. doesn't count, right? <laughs> and then uh, so so like it counts, it counts. yeah, it counts. Uh, but um, basically, the thought process for Oldham specifically for me was kind of what you alluded to. I was like, everybody, everybody in the game of Flesh and Blood knows that the Guardian Mirror is probably the lowest variance form of flesh and blood there is right so if there's yep. ever a clear leader in regards to skill or skill expression that person will probably win 90 percent of the time in regards to a guardian mirror so mm-hmm. prepping for whatever it was pro tour 2 or whatever you know i was a couple weeks out like we are now from pro tour 4 and I was like, I just can't hop on Oldham because I don't think I can beat the Hamiltons, the Fangs, the the Ben Hannons, you know, those very like solidified, you know, people that have a lot of reps. And I, I was like, and and everybody should go to an event to win. So my thought process was in the time that I have, I don't think I can accrue enough of an edge to combat those people. Therefore, mm-hmm. it inhibits my ability to win. Uh Right. Now, I did kind of like force myself out of that by playing Bravo at Worlds. Uh, It was not the best pick, but I was like, I kind of like took what you said. I realized it a little bit that I was, that's kind of what I was doing was I was just kind of basically like playing scared in in poker and uh, not giving myself the chance. And I just kind of forced myself. And it actually turned out pretty well. Uh, I, I think I won. I think I only lost like one mirror, and I played a decent number of them. Uh, it was against yeah. it was against Hamilton, but you know. <laughs> um, but also the second example of like reasons of why I haven't played the best deck is Lexi. Uh, Lexi, I never registered at a tournament, and it was always because I thought somebody was going to come at me with like some crazy off the wall fatigue strategy that I would lose in sideboarding. So like. You, mm-hmm. Like a Phi, like you sit across from Phi and, you know, like yeah, yeah, Naib, yeah. for example, right? It's a great example, yep, right? Yep. You sit across from him and you're like, nobody in their right mind is going to board up to 70 cards and fat deck against a Phi. Like that's a losing strategy every single time. But then Naib loads up Kadachis and all these one for fives and then fatigues you, right? And yep. like, that's just like, that is my greatest fear are situations like that. Yeah. Uh, I did see some people in the chat were talking about that concept. Like, you know, when you're playing the best deck, you're playing a known quantity, you're going to have the target on your back, right? Right. But the thing is that we all play... We are playing a game that has basically a defined set of rules. There's, there's all the cards that you can play are are like behave the same way every time. And... The game company printed these cards, and just by virtue of how they printed the cards, like some of the cards are just better than the other cards, mm-hmm. right? And and some of the decks are just gonna like perform better than the other decks, and it's not, like it doesn't matter if Bobby shows up to the tournament with like a sick like Riptide strategy into Lexi, because most of the time you're not going to be playing against that guy and he's not going to be doing statistically as well as you playing like a better deck, right? Right. I think it's like a trap uh, because, yeah, yeah, like on in any given game, in any given game, like you will always have a chance to lose to like some strategy that you haven't prepared for. Right. But we want to try to optimize for performance for the tournament as a whole, but not only for the tournament as a whole, but just like for every single game of Flesh and Blood that we ever decide to play, you know, in a competitive setting, right? Right. And so like the way that we can maximize our win rate, not only over the course of any like one game that we're playing is by playing the decks that just have like the better win rates. 
Right. So you're you're basically saying that the mathematical edge you're paying too much of an opportunity cost dodging rogue strategies than the advantage you accrue by just playing better cards. Yeah, like so I think I think there's and and I don't want people to kind of misconstrue what I'm saying because I I always want to leave the possibility that a un tested or like an unknown quantity actually ends up being really good. So an example of that is when Michael Hamilton brought uh, Bullander to US Nationals, right? Like nobody had play, really played that deck in mm -hmm. a competitive setting before. Or like, for example, when Charles Dunn won the other US Nationals with, you know, like Fatigue Briar. Mm -hmm. And so even though that deck, I think, had been played like in one or two tournaments, it wasn't like really on people's radars, right? Right those decks are still fundamentally good flesh and blood decks like they have good numbers they they're they're they don't have like necessarily like flaws right and so just because people don't know about the deck doesn't mean that you shouldn't play it but you need to make sure that when you're choosing um when you're choosing a deck to play that you're choosing a deck to play because you believe in the strengths of the deck and less so because of its um i guess like existence in the metagame or like how people are be able to like strat or counter strat into it etc right right that makes sense yeah so i yeah i i think that overall um you're going to just get better success playing better decks and 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 when you were talking about you know how you were kind of afraid to play older mirrors, right? I think, um, cause I, I played like a lot of old mirrors testing into like Michael Fang and like other like really good players back in the day. And it's just like one of the things that you kind of get the benefit of. And, and I think this is like really important for uh, all the people who want to, you know, play, play flesh and blood or like anything competitively is that the benefit that you get as somebody who is coming into the game or like deciding to pick up a deck later on than everybody else is that you don't really have to go through the same kind of learning process that these players that you respect had to go through. So what I mean by that is you can pull up a video of Michael Fang playing like an older mirror, or you can like find a video of like Michael uh, Hamilton playing like Icelander versus like whatever, somebody else. Right, right. And you can and you can learn what they're doing and you can try to figure out what they're doing and you don't have to like do the work yourself. And so I think that's an aspect of um, that's an aspect of of competition that I think a lot of people kind of get wrong where it's honestly very difficult as as players who are trying to like play at the very top level to try to get better because there's just no resources available like who like like what videos are you going to watch? right you're right. kind of like making you're like making the strategy you're like making the videos and so it's like much easier for you to kind of catch up to them than it is for you to you know than than to like stay ahead essentially yeah that, that makes 100 percent perfect sense and then and then i think that like i think like for example like in the old himir basically like the the only thing that i that I was doing like my only strategy in the old, in the older mirror when I was playing it is to try to like never waste like a tunic tick up. For example, this is like before mm -hmm. I think um, before Van Braces came out. Yeah, when like, they were when, using when, Sledge. When, yeah. Yep. And and it was just like, and then it's like once you kind of figure out like the key to like how to play like a certain matchup like then it like the game kind of turns into like easy mode and you just like you just optimize for that and, and the rest of it is just like execution like how well are you able to like handle like like corner case scenarios and, and stuff like that but it but i think like my my main point is just that like in order for you to like get to that point like you can get to that point by like watching how these other people are playing right like like you can you can you can figure out that oh like like michael is playing in a way where he's just like trying to use his tunic every time it comes up right that, I mean, th those are some amazing points. Uh, so, basically, learning curve is shortened when it's already discovered. Um, makes a lot of sense, and it's actually a great point because 
there was a lot of times where I actually leveraged that uh, in learning Icelander. Uh, that's another deck that I, I never played because I was I was a part of the group that kind of like brought a uh, during the tournament that um, that Michael Hamilton brought the first instance of Bullander to. I actually brought a Rusted Relic Briar. Uh, list that did really well. I bubbled out once again at like 13th because uh, I tied at table number two. Uh, yeah. And unfortunately, and uh, that knocked me out of top eight. Uh, unfortunately, that was the same time when I knocked Lucas out of top eight as well. I can't let him, <laughs> I can't let him forget about that one. But, um, you know, it, it was an unorthodox kind of like strategy where I would ran a couple rusted relics in like AB2 and Crown. And I would just yeah. kind of like f- fatigue, and then I, ha- I ran a couple of um, diabolic ultimatums, basically, and I would blow up mm-hmm. the frost hex and allow them to uh, not. Uh, yeah, that was my strategy, and it worked perfect for the f- one Icelander I played. But that was the one that I drew against because the game went on too long, so it kind of oh, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it blew up against me. But you know, it happens. It happens. Yeah. yeah. Um. So yeah, I, I think that's that's a good. That's a good spread on the basically scared to play the first uh, or the the top deck. Is there anything else you wanted to cover uh, on that topic, or do you want to move over to just tournament preparation in general? Um, yeah, let's let's move on to tournament preparation in, in general because sure. I think um, there are some things that I want to touch on, which kind of link to this idea as well. Okay. Um. So I think. And this might this might ring familiar to you if you ever you know entered some like poker tournaments, but mm-hmm. uh, basically like any any in any poker tournament that you enter, like you're gonna bring like a certain strategy that you play, right? You're gonna play like a certain way, right? Um, same thing in in Flesh and Blood, and in Flesh and Blood, the way that we do that is you know we prepare for like a certain way that we want to draft our decks, a certain way that we want to build our sealed pools, and also the deck that we choose and how we, we want to play it into the matchups that we decide to prepare for, right? Like, that is our strategy. Right. I, I think uh, the biggest mistake that most people make, honestly, is that they are not going into the tournament with that kind of mindset, where you need to go into the tournament with a strategy. It doesn't have to be the best strategy, right? It right. doesn't have to be foolproof. It, it, you, just, you just need to have something that you're going into the tournament and you're like, this is my strategy and this is how, and, and I believe that this strategy is going to give me an edge into all the other people that I'm playing. So, for example, um, when, uh, when I was playing at the Calling in Hartford, uh, and and this was the event I think that I res- responded to you about. Mm-hmm. I think my strategy in, uh, for example, in sealed and also in in draft and heavy hitters limited when I was playing the games, would be something like I want to, um, I always want to go first, and I always want to block my equipments as soon as I can. Okay. Right. And that is. Basically, like what, like, like other than other than the like how to how to draft the decks and 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 put them together, but like in terms of like playing the games out, like that is primarily like the thing that I'm focused on when I'm you know playing the games. Right. And so it it'll just be like something as simple as that, right? Like you just need to like find some sort of strategy that you come to the tournament with, and you're like, this is what I have prepared and this is how I think I'm going to get an edge. And sure enough, like I, I had like a bunch of people, like they, they won the dice roll. They chose that I go first because you know, it's, it's very different. It, like it's, it's counter to what has been the case in all the other drafts that we've played so far. Right. 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 Like you usually want to go second. Um, but yeah, I, I just felt pretty strongly for that tournament that I wanted to go first. Just curious. So, what was the, what was the, what was the data point or the reason that you really wanted to go first in those games? Just to give people oh, yeah. some context. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think I said this on in my like five hour long like heavy hitters review when I was just like <laughs> looking at the cards at first. Uh, but I noticed that a lot of the classes, it seemed like it was like kind of difficult to get go again. Uh, you need to like have some kind of setup. 
to have like agility token and like for the guardians for example that's why i thought that the auras were going to be pretty good because like even though they're not like good quote unquote rate like you play them it's two cards it gives you five damage it doesn't seem very good mm -hmm. but i thought that it would be kind of hard for your opponent to punish you by sending just like a random four cards back at you whereas this was not really the case in many of the other draft formats that we played I think an outsider, sometimes it's like a little bit true because like like Riptide, for example, if he doesn't have like pumps, and his hand can't like really send four cards back at you if you just like don't attack him. Right. Um. So, the reason why I wanted to go first is because I did believe that with setup you could you know play five cards. So you like make an agility token, or, or you're like giving Betsy overpower or like whatever the case is. So I wanted to have an arsenal card, right? I want to be the first person to put an arsenal card. And I thought that my opponent would not be able to consistently send at least three cards back at me in an efficient manner. And if you look at like a lot of the cards that are printed, like like what is KO going to do? They're going to send like like six or seven damage back at you, or like a Guardian, like they can play like a Red Thunk that's like eight damage. Right, right. Um, so basically, you're so, just take you're saying that the Arsenal is a higher value than the. Uh, in, in prob more than likely, your probability of not being able to use all of your cards offensively kind of like cancels out the the tempo that they start with. Uh, now, yeah, yeah, like I, I thought, I thought they were gonna waste like a card on average every time going second. Right, and how did that pan out? Knowing what you know now versus then, which is obviously going to be astronomically different because we both drafted so many times by now. Um, yeah, do you still feel that way, or do you think it's? Uh, not quite um, that simple. So I think there's some debate. There's some debate as to whether or not it's like better to go first or second. But I think as like a general heuristic, I still stand by it. Okay. Um. So I think that's like a big part of the reason why I was able to do so well at the tournament was because I kind of found found out found that out before everyone else, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And so like coming to the tournament with like any strategy, and I think it's perfectly fine if like if you went to, into the tournament, you're like. I want to go second every single time, right? Mm -hmm. um, as long as as long as you're going through the act act of deciding ahead of time, like, hey, like, I I did my prep work, um, and I decided that this is like the best way that I want to play, and and it's okay to be wrong, and it's okay to like be right, and then end up losing, right? Like that happens all the time as well. Oh, okay, I I get what you're saying. So like, you're saying that it's okay. You just want to go in with something. And like have a reason behind it, and then if you're wrong, yeah. you learn from it. But if you just exactly. go in and you win the die roll, and you just sit there and look at your opponent, like, uh, I don't know, I'll go second. And you, if you end up being wrong in that situation, you basically robbed yourself of that learning opportunity. Yeah, like you have no way to like like you don't have like a system for for evaluating after the fact right like after the fact you can like go back and and look at your tournament run and be like hey like this is what i thought was correct and let and then let me think about like all the games that i played was did, a, did that like pan out to be true right 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 you're just like if you if you just go into it and you're like oh i guess like i guess going second is like better than flesh and blood i'm just gonna go second um if, if that's not something that you're actively like thinking about um as being like part of your strategy then you're never gonna like like that point is never gonna be something that you're ever gonna consider like it after the after the fact is what I'm saying. I, I, like it doesn't have to be like going first, going second. It just has to be like some some aspect of the game, right? Like any aspect right. of the game that that you want to isolate and you want to say like, hey, like this is this is like how I'm I'm going into the tournament, um, and and how I, how how I want to play. Makes perfect sense. You're just trying to establish a control variable so you can measure it. Yeah. Yep. Um, what else did you want to cover on uh, tournament prep? Yeah. Uh, so I think like the everything else with with re that's that I want to talk about related to like tournament prep in terms of like how how you or like anybody else can can kind of try to like push to get to like the next level or whatever. All, all kind of like relates to that first point that we, we just talked about. Okay. So all of your prep basically should be like focused on like on like creating these like strategies that you're that you're gonna go in with. So like you said, when when you um, when you came up with like the rusted relic like into Icelander, uh, 
like that that is like one specific strategy that you came up with and you said like it it, it did what you wanted to do which is like prevent you from dying to the icelander right like, like right they couldn't combo you out like they're they're going to fatigue if you have more time right um so like the only way that you get there is by um being very focused with with what it is that you want to kind of look for during your testing process. So I'm sure when you came up with that strategy, when you were playing Briar, I, I'm sure that you knew that Icelander was going to be, uh, if not popular, at least like somewhat represented. Mm -hmm. And you and and it it was, I think, like not a great matchup for Briar if you play like the normal way, right? Hundred percent. So you do testing and you try different things out, and then. The only way that you get to um, the only way that you get to the point that you got to was I'm sure that you said like, hey, like this, I I, I want to find out how to beat Icelander. I want to try like X Y Z different strategies, and then you finally ended up on one that you were kind of satisfied with in terms of like the cost that it it brought to like your deck construction as well as you know like what you felt comfortable executing on at the tournament, right? Exactly. Yep. So so I think that. It, Basically, the people who are going to end up doing the best um, in in tournaments are going to just like go through this process to account for more and more um, scenarios, I guess. So you need to like you need to make um, you need to make a strategy that covers like at least all, definitely all of like the most commonly um, encountered scenarios. Like, let's say you know that there's going to be like dromais. And KOs and victors, right? Like those are, I think, probably like three of the most um, performing decks right now, mm -hmm. uh, according to the data. You can't go into the tournament without having a plan for these three heroes, right? Right. It's just it, it's. Um, if you want to do well, you have to have something in mind, and you kind of just like go down the list of. You go down the list of of everything that that you think you're going to encounter in in terms of like likelihood because you, you obviously you have to balance you know the cost of developing the strategy like the time that it's going to take the amount of cards that you need to put in your deck in order to do so uh and and you don't have like an infinite amount of time to prepare we have two more weeks before we get to the pro tour there's only so much i can't like spend like 20 hours figuring out like how to counter riptide because it's just like it's kind of a waste of time, right? Okay. Um, I swear that's not a psyop. I'm not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <time>. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just an example. Oh, everybody's um, gonna take it as that, right? Because we're content creators, so you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. You heard it here first. <laughs> um, uh, but but basically, like you have to you have to like weigh and and I think like the key is trying to like maximize. You want to you want to maximize whatever resources you have available to you, whether that's in, in the form of time, whether that's in the form of people that you can reach out to for for testing and for information, like whatever you want to leverage, like all the resources that you have, and and take whatever resources that you have and like maximize them. So I think for most people, like the limiting factor is going to be time. So for sure, like for tournament preparation, like you need to you need to just like have solid game plans into like the most represented decks and then after that then you can start like working your way down and like oh well there there also might be some people playing ninja like katsu like i think pudding just posted that he's been doing really well and he posted like a list that he he was doing well with mm -hmm. so you're gonna have to test into that uh you're gonna have to test into um like uh other warrior decks like asai or, or dorinthia or or bolton I, I know that all three of those heroes have been getting like some traction as well right mm -hmm. so you basically you're just like prioritizing you're like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna be prepared for like xyz and whatever okay so and i think like so yeah just, sorry go ahead yeah just real quick so basically what i'm hearing was the the idea that i had for icelander rest of relic briar kind of situation the process was correct, but I probably went wrong by not completely evaluating the opportunity cost that I was giving up in other matchups because that that game plan obviously was there was several sideboard pieces that 
only worked for that one match, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and so like maybe I paid a little bit too much opportunity cost for that uh, that one specific game plan. Does that kind of summarize it pretty well? Yeah. Well, it's hard to say because you also have to kind of look at like how you did in the tournament as a whole. Because like you're at table two, you draw. Like you're obviously doing pretty well at the tournament, right? Mm-hmm. But you also don't only miss top eight because you like whiff out on one match. I think you could you could have missed like I think like two or three matches, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's like that match, you draw. It sucks. Then you have to kind of look at like what are some of the other matches like that you lost? Did you get did you lose because you got unlucky? Honestly, like the hardest part is differentiating like if you lost because you got unlucky or if you lost because of like a preparation issue, right? Right. Uh, so you you have to like you have to be able to take an objective look and and then to say because like honestly like maybe you just got unlucky like maybe you you prep the right way and you know whatever like the tournament didn't like run out the way that you wanted to maybe you ran into like a low percentage matchup and you just ended up losing maybe like your opponent just like drew like like a really good sequence of cards right and then you even though in testing you're like 75 percent into like the stack um this was like the 25 percent chance that like you lose right right and i think we as card players need to be like okay with getting unlucky and <laughs> and not performing like it sucks cuz even in a game like flesh and blood that has like relatively low variance mm-hmm. i think that there's still honestly like a decent amount of variance in the game so that like uh even though the better players win most of the time i don't think that that's true all the time and if you actually believe for example that like brody spurlock or whatever is like one of the best players in the world like he whiffed pretty hard on like the the couple callings that he went to recently right Mm -hmm. and so like part of that is probably due to 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 luck and the part of that is probably due to the fact that he was unprepared relative to his competition right um so i i think that it's I think that we need to like be able to take an objective look. So like maybe like after the fact when you when you like do a retrospective look at that like nationals run that you had, then you can be like, oh, I I drew against the Icelander that I like spent a lot of time and and cards in my sideboard to to work on, but maybe like I I like lost a draft game. Maybe I would have my time would have been better spent doing like maybe like one or two drafts or like reviewing like the draft logs for for like those drafts with other people uh, on my team. You know what I mean? Like. It, it's it's it, that that's like the kind of thought process that I would go through after like if I if I wanted to like look back and 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 redo like the tournament. So so what what is one piece of advice you'd give to people? Uh, we'll just use myself as an example. Um, kind of you know one one downside to anybody that can relate to being heavily analytical or logical, uh, just have like those thought processes usually, uh, is Mm -hmm. basically you're very good at justifying circumstances. And what do I mean? What do I mean by that? It means that like, I'm a smart enough individual to think of like a situation like, okay, let's say I drop round six and I say, okay, I didn't make top eight. Well, what if I won that match and got put in the bracket with some of my worst matchups? Maybe I didn't even place as high as I did, right? Yeah. Like, you know, when you're very analytical, it's very easy to come up with those. I I don't want to say excuses. They kind of are. But at the same time, they're just like logical steps uh, that are historically probably very wrong. Uh, but they make sense because we create them in a very well put together way. Uh, Yeah. Do do you have any like tips or tricks or ideas? I know it's a difficult question to kind of like stop yourself from doing things like that. Yeah, I think, I think being objective is honestly very difficult and as somebody who's very analytical, it becomes very easy to have the veneer of objectivity, mm-hmm. I think. Yep. But in actuality, you're kind of falling prey to, you know, the same kinds of logical fallacies that other people are doing it. But like you said, you're just constructing like a better story than exactly. other people are. Exactly. I I would say that... Um, this is like, I think we're having like a good support system is very helpful. 
Like you need people who can be honest with you mm -hmm. around you. Um, people who like aren't afraid to tell you, hey, like you really mucked it up, you know, on this in this round in this way because of X, like X, Y, Z, right? Mm -hmm. um, or people like, and, and because you know that they have that honesty, uh, that they're not afraid to tell you when you messed up, that when they tell you, hey, like you just got unlucky, like you can trust that. Right. Um, you can't only have people who are just like, oh, you just got unlucky, like whatever, like 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 people who are trying to be like positive. Yeah, like I, there's no growth there. Right. Yeah, yeah, like like you need you need honesty. So I would say having a really good support system is very useful. And I would say like the other thing that you need to do is to just like not care so much about the results but caring more about the process like and honestly like doesn't even like matter like what your um like like it doesn't matter what your what what your like win loss uh in certain matchups are like when we're talking about like creating a strategy and like executing and implementing it and spending your time before the tournament like the only metrics that like actually matter are um was your time well spent did you prepare for all the matchups that you encountered or likely would have encountered during the tournament by looking at, you know, what, what people ended up playing. Mm -hmm. uh, did you, um, did the strategies that you came up with, were they effective in what it, it was that you wanted to do? Or did you miss something in preparation? Right. Right. In many ways, like the eventual outcome of like the win loss, whatever, isn't as important as answering these questions because even if you won and you got lucky and you implemented a strategy that like the, like you put in these cards uh these cyborg cards and they just ended up being like kind of replacement value right like you put in uh let's say like choke slam you're playing guardian you play choke slam and you're playing it into ko and you're like oh it's going to be like really good but then like in during the game like you found like you were just sitting on an arsenal because a lot of the turns like they didn't you know, have like a way to like set up my tokens or something, right? Like right. just like for example, and it just ends up being like a four for eight attack. It's like these are the things that you have to kind of answer for yourself, and it doesn't matter like whether or not you won it or you lost, because like whether or not you win or you lose, it's not only dependent on your actions, it's also dependent on your opponent's actions. Like they have to be playing better than you, worse than you, draw better than you, draw worse than you, etc. Like there's a lot of variables that you can't control. And like the only things that you can control are how you spend your time and how you prepare, right? Absolutely. Uh, and also on the topic of preparing, um, we do have a question in chat. Uh, the question is, so in testing, do you start by casting a wide net and playing the field, making little optimizations in a deck as a whole? Or do you focus on matchups where you testing an idea off the bat? So basically, do, do you kind of like try something that's tried and true cast a wide net mm -hmm. to solve it or do you try to come up with that unique idea first um i think that's going to be largely contextual uh based off of circumstances so i'll give two examples where i did kind of either ends of the spectrum right mm -hmm. um for calling krakow i played viscerai and blitz mm -hmm. i think my entire flesh and blood career up until that point I had just been like, not like a casual player, but I like didn't play chain because one, I didn't have the cards. I didn't enjoy the place. It was clearly the best deck. Right. I was not yet in my like play the best deck like era of of my growth as a flesh and blood player. But I was I would always play like combo viscerai. You know when Mono mm -hmm. came out, Sonata Arcanix came out, and like that deck was not that good, right? Like it was playable, but it wasn't like it was clearly not the best deck. Right. But then when Everfest came out, like, it, it actually became, you know, one of the best decks. Mm -hmm. So when Calling Krakow came out, uh, or, or was, like, announced, and we were playing Blitz format, like, like Blitz, Viscerai, after Everfest came out, was, like, by far the best deck in that format. It was, like, not even close. Yep. Um, so in that, um, in that... Uh, scenario like I kind of got lucky right like I had put in a lot of time beforehand preparing essentially like wasting my time but it just ended up being useful later on because I had like the experience to kind of evaluate like how it is that I wanted to like build my viscerai blitz deck right and so in that case I 
didn't really uh, I didn't really have to cast a wide net and 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 like try a lot of different things out. Like I knew that I was gonna play Vistra. I knew that he was broken beyond belief, and I knew that all I had to do was just like make sure that I like um, had like these little optimizations kind of ready. Um, another uh, another scenario. I think when when PT Baltimore was was out, and we were like trying to test, and and we I think we ended up um, playing Lexi, but as a whole, like we didn't really figure out like how to put like how to build Lexi. Like Lexi seems strong, but like we weren't really sure like how to build her, right? Mm -hmm. And so in that case, like because I didn't have like any prior experience, like we spent so much time playing like all the different decks in the format. And I spent like a ton of time like playing all these different decks to like eventually settle on playing Lexi like a week before the tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that case, basically like my preparation for that tournament was that I needed to, um, I, I basically prepared for the tournament by playing like all the other decks uh, and, and learning like a little bit from each of them. And you know, Honestly, even though I didn't do that well at that tournament, I felt like in terms of preparation, it was all right. Mm -hmm. But I, but like it just, I it's it's contextual based off of kind of your circumstances, and like there, like that's like another aspect of variance that I think that people aren't like taking into account, like how you choose to spend your time, even like outside of like the actual like tournament preparation process maybe there's some like hero that you like really like playing at armory and you've just been playing them at armory for the last like, I don't know, like three months and they come out with part the misfield and then all of a sudden now like this hero's op right right um there's just like a lot of things that you can't like really control for and so i think my advice is that you just have to kind of like every time that you're like going to play an event you just evaluate like where you are like like maybe maybe you were on the sauce beforehand. <laughs> I sent a tweet to Josh Lau. I was like, I I, I said that he was going to win the pro tour because I thought that heavy hitters made warrior pretty strong. Uh, and it's just like yeah, like sometimes you get lucky and you get put into a good circumstance, and sometimes you know you just don't have that amount of experience, and you just have to you just have to kind of work from the ground up. So that's a that's a great. That's a great point. And one question about the Viscera situation. You said that you kind of wasted a lot of time, but it turned out to not be wasting time because he turned out to be the best deck in the format. Uh, yeah. But where do you draw that line? Because once again, being an analytical person, I see that it's very easy three months later to run into like Riptide or something and say, Oh, this isn't the best deck in the format right now, but like I'm gonna win a calling in in a couple months when he gets a little bit of support, <laughs> right? Like I, I I would say I would say that largely, on average, it's gonna be a better use of your time to get experience and play the decks that are proven to be good, mm -hmm. um, and that if you have infinite time or you have like a lot of time and you have excess time that maybe like you don't want to just like keep playing, you know, like the same deck and you get burnt out, right? Like, you know, preserving mental is like a big aspect of competing as well, right? Right. And then so, yeah, like sure, like play play Riptide at, at your armories because it makes you happy. Right. Um, then it's not, you are like, you're not like wasting your tournament prep time. That's like your off time. Makes sense. Makes sense to me. All right. Is, is there anything else you want to cover on the topic of tournament prep? Um, I think that the the last thing that I would really want to say to like everybody who's watching, mm -hmm. um, if if they are preparing for, if they're planning to play like any like competitive, uh, any competitive game, whether it be Flesh and Blood or or anything, they they want to enter like the, the the calling in Las Vegas, or they they're playing the Pro Tour, or, like whatever the case is. They they're playing the RTNs. They're they're playing Armory even, right? Mm -hmm. If you're somebody who wants to play and get better and like try to win, I think like the most important thing that you need to have is that the, is the mentality and the belief that you are capable of winning. Um, and I think that this is going is going back to like the very first thing that we covered um, when you're talking about like playing the best deck. I think like the Worst thing that you can do to yourself is put yourself into a bucket where you think that you cannot win in a given situation. Because 
like you said, like, if, especially, like, if you have, like, an analytical mind, you're going to, like, find, like, ways and like, you're going to look for patterns and you're going to, like, do all these all mental gymnastics mm -hmm. to make it so that you're correct in the end. Right. And if you don't have the belief that you can be better than everybody else at one aspect of the game and then that aspect of the game ends up being, you know, like, the most important aspect of the game for, like, that particular tournament if you don't have that belief that you can that you can work at something and and improve then you've kind of lost before you've even started that that's a, so, that's a really good point that's a really good point yeah in any any tips on like uh, there there's a common situation i just something i i kind of picked up on like a lot of people talking in social media and stuff like that it seems like a lot of fab players kind of suffer from like paralysis through analysis kind of situation where they they go too far into the weeds to where they're really not getting anything done they're not making any progress because the second that they you know they'll play katsu and then you know because katsu beats dromai but then katsu loses to you know oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then they're like oh no and i can't and then kano comes yeah because and and like, like if you're there that for long enough you will just do 360s all day long because everybody's losing yeah, to something yeah. so do you have any like tips on just like how to minimize that situation and and like do if KO is winning the most events, is that a is that a, like a, enough of a burden of proof to say okay, uh, or does it depend on what level you're playing on? Like if if you're if it's somebody that's just trying to earn an invite to their nationals, should they just go off of the data and play what is perceived to be the best deck, whether it is or is not? And then if you're kind of like higher on skill level, do you have the luxury of exploring more options? Um, it definitely like the like what information that you should look at definitely differs depending on like what level of tournament you're playing. So, for example, if you're just trying to get an invite to nationals, right? You're playing at an RTN. Your RTN is gonna vary between I don't know like sixteen to sixty players, right? Mm -hmm. But it's gonna be the sixteen to sixty players that are geographically pretty close to where you live, unless. You're in Canada, and then Brody decides to fly to your RTN. <laughs> uh, um, but, you know, like, you have, like, a pretty good idea, or you should have a pretty good idea of, like, what all the locals around you like to play, right? Mm -hmm. You play with them all the time. And so you got to come at the data that gets published, let's say, on the main website, and, and then it's like, oh, they're like, oh, like, these, like, different decks have been winning. RTNs, and you gotta like take that with a grain of salt because then you gotta think about okay, well, does that apply for the tournament that I'm entering? Maybe at the tournament that I'm entering, everybody loves playing Victor, and so like it doesn't really matter if um, if uh, what's it called? Let's say if you believe that Dromai has like a really good matchup into Victor, like it doesn't matter that if like Dromai like loses hard to like ninjas, like who cares? Like like everybody around me is playing Victor, so I'm just gonna play Dromai, you know? Right, right. Uh, uh, I think I think you you have to kind of look at it from that perspective. I think um, for uh, you, us who are gonna play at the Pro Tour, it's like a little bit um, it's a little bit harder. Like for example, I I, I was in our um, I was in our team Discord and I was like talking about how I wish that they published um, top eight statistics for uh, those nationals. They used to do like that winners. too. They used to do that, and it was such an invaluable resource because. You got more depth to the data, right? You could actually make like good estimations on like, representation, not just whoever spiked the event. Because at ProQuest and RTN season, like there's so many splits and everything, right? So like you don't, whoever wins the event is not necessarily like a burden of proof or anything. Sorry, I had to jump yeah, in. Yeah, and then all. also, yeah, no, no, <laughs> I, I definitely agree. And then I think also like I, to me, like getting first seed in road to nats is a better indicator for what you should be playing at the pro tour than like winning the rtn because if you think about like the the tournament structure right mm -hmm. it's four rounds of cc then you play two drafts and then you play four more rounds of, of cc so like your most important rounds in the tournament are going to be the first four rounds that you play mm -hmm. which is going to have like basically like the widest uh the widest part of the meta and you're going to be playing against kind of like the most like random like set of opponents, right? Right. And so like in, in that instance, like it's like much, it's like a much better indicator if if you can find like decks that 
have the ability to consistently like XO their Swiss than like to win in top eight. Like winning in top eight doesn't matter as much as like XOing Swiss. Hundred percent agree. Um. So yeah, it's like it, it just really depends. Like you just have to like you have to figure out like for the tournament that you're entering, like what is like the most important, I guess like piece of data. And, and I would I would say that like uh, for like a more generalized thing, like um for people who are like maybe like less sure about like what deck they they want to play, and then and they want like some data on like what um on 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 whether or not it's like worthwhile to like spend time on a hero i would say that any of the heroes that are winning rtns at like a decent clip are probably like strong enough to at least like consider so like it doesn't have to be like the most winning decks at the rtns like it, as long as you're like capable of winning a tournament the deck is probably powerful enough to consider, um, which you know wasn't always the case, right? Like right. in in other like less balanced uh, meta games, like there were maybe only like two or three decks that were worth considering. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so does that does that conclude the the tournament preparation part? Yeah, I think I okay. I think I hope uh, everybody who's listening or watching. Your stream got a lot of value out of out of this talk. I mean, overall, I, I, hope, mean, I hope you got value out of this talk. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I mean, we've gotten a lot of feedback in the chat already, saying that it's it's been really well. We even got Ponkage in there saying, uh, "All my losses <laughs> are because variants, and all my wins are pure skill." You know, that's that's some wise <laughs> stuff there. Hundred percent agree with yeah. that. Yeah, uh, but um, yeah. So I just wanted to kind of. It just as as we kind of wind down or whatever, I just wanted to kind of try to find a couple more nuggets for like a very specific player base, okay? And the player base sure. that I'm aiming for is the people that are thinking about dipping their toes into competitive play. What I'm really looking at okay. is like like the players that are like maybe just top eighting RTNs and pro quests and stuff like that, but like not re maybe go to a calling or two a year. Right. Mm -hmm. But not like, we're not talking about never been to a pro tour. Right. Is, is sure. kind of the bracket that we're, we're trying to like really analyze here. What yeah. do you have any tips in like just broad stroke stuff? It could be specific. Uh, you know, is, is there anything that you would do or recommend to kind of like help that very specific demographic? You need to find at least one or two friends. You need to find at least one or two friends who have kind of the same goals as you do of trying to, you know, dip your toes into the next level mm -hmm. and who want to like, and who want to do well at the tournaments. Um, I was, we were just uh, on like Flake's uh, podcast. And then, and if I think Flake was like talking about like, oh, like our team's kind of like the end all be all of, of kind of like where competitive flesh and blood is headed and mm -hmm. like i don't think that's the case i think i think the benefit of of having teams is that you have a bunch of like like-minded individuals but like for example runaways we just started as like four people right right um like when when dan got second at, at u.s nationals our team was just four people mm -hmm. um so you need to find at least a couple of people who kind of want to do the same thing that that you're doing because it's really helpful for everybody to be like around the same level. Um, I don't mean like in terms of play, but like around the same like commitment level. Mm -hmm. Because if you guys are all like kind of committed to like trying to do the same thing, then you're gonna be the most receptive to uh, each other's needs. And then that way you guys can kind of figure, like bounce ideas off of each other. And like I said earlier, like it's really helpful to have like a support system of people who can, you know, be honest with you and, um, and and help you improve, right? Okay. And, and if you were um, to, what, uh, what way would you recommend somebody find people? Uh, do you, I'm gonna plug the runaways. Now I, 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 uh, I was trying to make it easy. I was trying to make it easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm gonna plug the runaways Discord. So uh, I mean, like, we're we have the we have our Discord right now. Um. I think most people know us for, you know, like doing like drafts uh, on the site, but as well mm -hmm. as like there's a bunch of like community channels as well. 
Um, and basically the kind of uh, goal of the Discord, um, and you don't have to like go through our Discord. You can like go to your store or whatever and like find mm-hmm. the and find the people. Um, but you know, like if you don't have people around you who necessarily want to do the same thing, like hey, like like hit up. Um, Hit, hit up like the general chat in some like online groups be like hey i'm trying to like do this i'm trying to like find like some people who want to who want to practice this is my schedule etc right because i think like definitely it can be like kind of scary i remember when i was like playing magic i i had like a bunch of friends like around me but i can't help but feel that if i had done more in the way of networking, in the way of kind of reaching out and trying to find like people who wanted to like test, I end I like end up in, in my position right now like n- knowing or being like uh, in connected to like a lot of like really good players that if when I was like grinding magic, if I had spent the time to try to like network and, and to try to like reach out and 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 just like get out of my shell instead of just like you know playing with like the people that I had been like really comfortable playing with the whole time i can't help but feel that i would have been a lot more successful right and so i think that just like being unafraid to no, i'm not saying like ditch your friends but like i'm saying like being unafraid to make new connections and finding like people who who are trying to do the same thing as you are i think that's going to be very helpful absolutely and uh just so everybody knows uh in the stream vod or chat whichever uh, whichever one you're interacting with, the Runaways invite link is in the description. So if you're interested in joining that, uh, just just scroll down there and there it is. Uh, also, I did want to put like a little asterisk on the fact of like finding people, right? Um, one thing that me personally, I would advise against, it, or not, not I guess that's the wrong way to put it, but just be be aware of what you're asking for in a place like, the infamous purple discord, right? Because (laughs) you just mentioned that it's very important to find people with equal commitment levels, right? But when you go to an area like the purple discord, it is a collective mind of people that have vastly different commitment levels, right? And that can, I'm trying to find the, the correct way to say it, but it can lead to just a lot of bad ideas i'm not saying it's all bad i'm just saying that it can kind of contaminate the process a little bit uh so just be a little aware of like you know the if you go do go to any general area now i will tell you if you go to the runaways discord you're not going to have that issue because it's a discord where people are actively seeking information and if everybody's actively seeking information to make them better then everybody's going to be at least on the positive end of the commitment level right whereas people in the purple discord just kind of chatting about their favorite hero and stuff like that right Uh, so i just wanted to give that little asterisk on like you know be careful of like who you're who you're um you're trying to find or, or practice with or when you're searching for people yeah was there Uh, i think that's well said yeah is there anything else that you wanted to hit on that specific uh demographic any tips or anything or is that cover it yeah so i think once you find like once you find some friends and you're getting and you're like um trying to compete i think like you just got to go out there and, and play the tournaments um i remember my first like magic ptq that i ever played in like i had just only played on the online client, which kind of handles like all the triggers and stuff for you. It's kind of like play on Talishar, right? Like every, it does everything for you. And I didn't realize that when you're playing magic in person, like you have to like announce everything. Right. So I like attack with my creature uh, that taps. Um, so it makes it so that my opponent can't block uh, with a creature. Um, he only has one creature. I like attack with it. He goes to block. I'm like, your guy's tapped. And he's like, oh, no, you have to announce it. I'm like, what? And so, like, I, I like, whiffed on top eight because oh, I, I, okay. I didn't know because I didn't know about that. And, right. you know, that's, like, a pretty negative experience, right? Right. But ultimately, the act of me just, like, going through that made me a better player because then I learned about, like, you know, what, what all the rules and stuff were. And so there's no, like, quick, there's no, like, quick fix. There's no, like, magic 
like formula that you can like that you can do or you can just like uh, hey like i'm gonna follow like nathan and yonji's like three steps to success and then well and i'm gonna go to the calling and i could crush it like right it's it's just not gonna happen like not not to say that like people haven't like done really well in their first term like they have they have but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm saying that it's not like uh it's not like a reliable like thing right like uh i think that the only way that you can like really the only the only thing that you can really do is actually go out and compete and and learn from all of your tournaments that you go to learn from all the competitions absolutely absolutely i think that's some great advice um also another thing we have mentioned probably 20 or 30 times during this talk uh about talking about the best deck and i'm not gonna let you go without asking you what is the best deck <laughs> and it, if you tell me ko you have to give me a second Wait, 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 I'd have to give you a second. Cause, cause that's an uh, easy answer. Uh, yeah, that's an easy answer. Uh, uh, okay. I, I mean, uh, I think the best, I think the best three decks are Ko, uh, probably like Ko, Dromai, and uh, probably some warrior, either Dorinthia or uh, Bolton. Okay, not Kasai, um, not Kasai specifically. Yeah, I think Kasai has some issues, um, and I I think that I, I think that Kasai's main issues are are that she has just like a terrible um, Kana matchup. Yep, absolutely, uh, and draw my matchup. It's horrendous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't like all of the heroes have their like pros and cons. But I'll tell you what. Like, I was playing KO earlier today, and Lucas watched me, and I had like two of my turns. Uh, I think I just attacked with like a blue attack. One one time I like played a blue attack, and I discarded like another blue attack. Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Don't look at the plays right now. Just look at the number at the end of the game." And at the <laughs> end of the game, after like seven or eight turns, it was like fourteen point six like average value per turn. Right. I'm like, yeah, like. I, I had like horrendous turns. I like attack with my bear fangs and I discarded a blood rush bella, but sometimes but somehow I have fourteen point seven. It, like, for I mean, the number, like kinda, the numbers don't lie, now. right? The, the numbers don't yeah. lie. Like if you're that far above <laughs> rate. It's like kinda crazy. Yep. It has to be in the discussion for best deck, absolutely. If you're on the bad side of variance and you're still cranking out fifteen value per turn. Um hundred percent yeah like i have games where i roll ones and then i win it's just like like what other deck can just like pass their turn and and win absolutely absolutely okay uh is is there anything else you want to cover i just want to give you one more chance to to kind of go toward anything if you want to um no i i hope that everybody found this useful um i originally when i uh when i reached out to you nathan to like to hop on the stream yep it was because i felt like you were you were like searching for answers and you wanted to like talk to somebody to like help help you kind of like move past like those like frustration like feelings of frustration um so i hope that this was um useful for that and uh yeah like if and then I, I said, like, I could plug. Dude, I, I was going to, like, come on here and, like, plug, like, my coaching or, like, uh, doing, like, more, like, detailed work with, like, somebody, like, on an individual basis. But, like, to be mm -hmm. honest, I don't, like, actively, uh, I don't actively, like, coach people. I just, like, mostly, you know, just, like, work with my team. Um, right. But, yeah, like, if anybody's interested, like, feel free to reach out. Yeah, and I, I really do appreciate it. Uh, that's one thing that, this is my first. Uh, this is my first TCG uh, that I've yeah. ever played, uh, as m most people know by now. And but it's not my first competitive venture, right? Like I've done right. a lot of things competitive, like poker, things like that. You know, just a lot of different avenues that I've kind of pursued on a competitive basis. Um, yeah. I've never seen, like in flesh and blood, how willing the community is to just help. Right, because like it's yeah. it's very easy to draw a line and say, okay, I'm on the card, guys. You're on Team Runaway. We're direct competitors, right? Which would very easily create a conflict of interest for this discussion. But like in the realm of flesh yeah. and blood, I it's just it's all two stepped, right? Like 
Now, I like to I like to caveat that with like I think it's like professionally competitive, right? We're not sharing deck lists or anything, but like yeah, yeah. you know, if somebody needs help, I've reached out to many people on teams with like a quick question about a matchup, about whatever the you know, just something small. And people are just always willing to help, right? And yeah. I don't know if it's just because people know that if they ever have a question on the return, they know they're going to get an honest answer from me and I would love to help them in return, you know, just honest networking or what the case is. But it's just, it feels like the community is very genuine in its ability to just kind of like connect and and just help each other. And it's, it's very unique. Yeah. I think the flesh and blood community is in general, pretty positive. Um, And I, Honestly, like Nathan, I think that um, with with most communities, I think that the the higher up you go, in terms of like seeking help, as long as you're as long as you're not like wasting the other person's time, like you have something like concrete, like don't come don't come to either of us and be <laughs> like, hey, like how do I how can I win with this deck? All right, like, right. That's like too general. But you, if you like you're like, hey, I'm struggling with this matchup. This is what I've tried so far, but it's not mm-hmm. working, right? Absolutely. Um, I think because we've all been there. Like, I remember, like, I first started, I was asking questions on, on Purple Discord on how to, like, play Combo Viscerai. And then some, like, there was this one guy, I forget his name now, um, from, from, I think he was from New Zealand. And then he was also, like, working on it as well. And then he showed me his deck. And then we, like, and then I, I, work, I spent a lot of time working on it. And it's just, like, I think because we've all been there, like we've all been like the person who like needed, you know, some help. Absolutely. That's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, so like, like was mentioned, uh, just before that, uh, you are offering coaching now. Um, not, not, is it, a, is it officially like open offering or are you just something you're just trying to help people and trying to like, yeah, if, if you are interested, um, I am not like openly advertising like that I do like coaching service. I don't like have anything set up, but if you are actually like interested in like getting to the next level, I think that I can probably be like pretty helpful for you and to just like message me on, on Twitter at Yonji Lee or message me on discord. I think I'm in the card guys discord uh, as well. You just like search for my name. Yep. Absolutely. If, if, if what you've seen in the stream is something that you would like to maybe ha- go over with him on like something that's more specific to you. I know a lot of this was kind of like some of it was a little broad, but a lot of it was kind of tailored toward like specific situations that I was going through. Uh, but we, we just wanted to make this a public experience so that because if anybody else was going through the identical situation, then just a lot more people get value and there's no reason not to do it that way. Right. Uh, just help more people in a broader stroke. Uh, definitely a positive way to do it. Is there anything that you want to plug? I know we went over the Discord. The link is in the description. Uh, you want to plug Twitter, the YouTube channel. I think there's a podcast too now, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a podcast, Runaways Pod. Uh, I don't know. Plug plug the card guys. You guys are great. <laughs> Yeah, if if you need a tier list, I uh, oh oh yeah yeah no dude, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, ca- I'm casting I'm casting Philly. Oh, you are. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah, That's awesome. So, so plug plug the plug Savage Feasts, Savage okay. Feats. Yep. They, yep. they put on a great production. Uh, contact Ethan if you want to sponsor uh, an ad segment. Uh, I think Runaways is sponsoring an ad segment for like some promotion that we're doing uh, at Pro Tour. It's pretty cheap. I think it's only like 150 or like 200 dollars for for an ad spot, uh, and it goes to a long way towards supporting the competitive flesh and blood coverage. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the the work that that Ethan does is just it, it's astronomical, right? Um, I think he's he's single. Well, I don't want to say single handedly because it's a joint venture with him and Nathan. Uh, they've done an, a, an astronomical job. Just providing the coverage that we, we we never had, right? Like back in 2021 and 2022, when we kind of like started playing, you know, we only saw the callings, like seeing a battle hardened. I, I remember back in the day, Michael Fang used to go around the tables and like 
type up on Twitter. Yeah, he would like, just like tweet. Yeah, he would say table one, Joe My V, Bravo, table two. This very, you know, like I mean, it was just like that was the only coverage we would get, right? And now um, we have Ethan with hand cams and great audio, and you know, just it's it's an amazing work. So any any way that we can get some more support that way is is I'm all for it, all for it. Uh, he does an amazing job over there. Uh, so once again, I just want to thank you for, for doing this. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Me personally, I hope everybody got something of value. I know I did. Uh, if there's any questions, um, I will say that you have for me or Yuanji, uh, just try to post it in the comments and then hopefully we can, we can talk you into kind of checking, uh, the comments periodic, pe- periodically over the next week or so in case you have any uh, directed toward you, or I can kind of like notify you if if you get anything. Yeah, yeah. I'll um, I'll, I'll I'll read the comments. Awesome, awesome, and uh, yeah. So that's gonna do it for us. Once again, thank you so much for joining me. I'm gonna close this out over the next ten minutes or so, but I really do appreciate you being on. Thanks, Nathan. It was a uh, was a lot of fun, and I wish you and the rest of your team good luck at uh, the Pro Tour. You as well. You as well. Good luck in your prep. See you later. Take care. All right, chat. We're while I close out, we're gonna leave Yuanji's pictures up there because he's still napping. But <laughs> oh, the picture cracks me up. It cracks me up. No, but it it really is amazing that like, um, you know, people on different competitive teams come together, share ideas. Um, the the thing that really resonated with me the most was. Um, the reasons behind not playing the best deck. I think I was really psyching myself out a lot uh, unnecessarily. And um, yeah, Yuanji's points kind of like painted that a lot clearer. I knew I was kind of hinting toward it a little bit before, but I mean, it, it's really clear now. Um, once again, if you're interested in that, seek him out. It can only get better. Um so that's going to pretty much conclude the stream. I mean, we've been going for like about two hours now, so it's a little bit long to be doing some gameplay on the end. Uh, but um, just to give people an update on my preparation for Pro Tour, uh, I have not locked in a deck yet. I told myself I was going to, but there's been so many data points. Uh, but my class has just ended yesterday, so now I'm like, for the next week or two, I'm just full-time flesh and blood. Uh, eight, ten hours a day, whatever it's going to take to get ready for uh, these uh, this event. So uh, hopefully by this weekend, definitely by the stream uh, next week, I will be able to... I don't know if I'm going to be able to share it, you know, because we got to keep that competitive integrity or whatever. But, like, um, we'll be closing in very quickly on what we're going to be playing for the Pro Tour. And, um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm excited for the testing and kind of get down on uh, figuring stuff out. So I just want to thank all of you for, for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Uh, and I will see all of you next Wednesday. Uh, hope everybody has a good last weekend at their RTN season. I know we have a one more week, which is kind of unique because usually it's three weeks, but this time it's four weeks. So we got one last weekend of RTNs. If you're going to one, I wish you the best of luck. Hope you score that invite. Uh, if you already have it, uh, good luck on getting the gold foil then. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining me. Hope somebody got something of value. Uh, 